بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله As we discussed last week, we're going to sit today and reflect on the ayat of Al-Wasaya Al-Ashar, the Ten Commandments in Islam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these orders or these commandments, and it comes in order like this in the Quran, as we talked about in the last two weeks about it, the characteristics of Ibad al-Rahman. Or if you look at another example in the beginning of Surah Al-Mu'minun, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Qad aflah al mu'minun that the believers have been successful. And then he starts to mention what are the characteristics of these believers who are successful. And here in these ayat that we have tonight, these wasaya, these commands from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are mentioned in Surah Al-An'am, Allah mentions 10 of them in order. Therefore, the believer, when we hear these ayat, we have to reflect on the meanings. The objective is not just to list them, but the objective is for us to pay close attention to them and then to compare our actions to these commands, to compare our actions to these characteristics, to see where are we from these characteristics, where are we from these commands. These commandments were listed in Surat Al-An'am, verses 151 to 153. And also similar ayat or similar commands in Surat Al-Isra, from verses 23 to 39. The first of these commandments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us with was قُلْ تَعَالَوْ أَتْلُ مَا حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ أَلَّا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا To come and to hear what, the, what Allah has made haram upon you. What Allah has made haram upon you, the first thing is أَلَّا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا To not join any partners with him. Why is this? What is the greatest sin that a man can commit? The shirk, joining partners with Allah. In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was asked, أَعْظَمْ What is the greatest sin? He said, أَن تَجْعَلْ لِلَّهِ نِدًّا To make something equal to Allah. Because this is the reality of shirk. When you join partners with Allah in worship, when you make dua to other than Allah, when you worship other than Allah, even if you're worshiping with Allah, because it's not always just worshiping something else, it could be worshiping something with Allah. What is the reality? Is that you're making these objects of worship, you're making them equal to Allah. And look in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, he talks to us, he talks to our fitrah, to our natural inclination, he talks to our rationale. When he said ﷺ, to make something equal to Allah and He's the one who created, created you. Allah is the one who created you. How can you make something equal to Allah in worship? He's the only one who has the right to be worshipped, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why in the wasaya, the advice that was given from Luqman to his son, what is the first thing that Luqman advised his son? Ya bunay, la tushrik billah. Don't join partners with Allah. The same thing. Don't join partners with Allah. Why did he tell him not to join partners with Allah? Inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Indeed, the shirk is great oppression. Oppression to yourself. And how can you join partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He's the one who created you. And that's why it's the one sin that will never be forgiven. The second of the character, the second of the commands, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And to be good and dutiful to your parents. And as the scholars mention, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right after mentioning the command to stay away from the greatest of sins, which is worshipping other than Allah, right after that he mentions to be good and dutiful to the parents. This shows the status of the parents in Islam. This shows us the importance of our parents. And if you look at the verses we mentioned in Surah Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the commands there, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا And your Lord has decreed that you not worship except for Him. The same command, the first one. And the second one, 
What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And to be good and dutiful to the parents. But the ayat in Surah Isra, there's more definition, there's more explanation of, of the treatment and the relationship and how it needs to be between the children and between their parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues saying, إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّكَ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدْهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا That whether one or both of them reach old age while with you, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا Do not say to them so much as uf and do not repel them. Uf, in the smallest amount of disagreement to your parents. Nowadays it's different. What do we say nowadays? When you don't like to do something, you hear a command, ah, or ah, that's all types of uf. The smallest type of, dis of disapproving with them. The smallest amount of rejecting what they're saying. Do not say to them, uf, wala tanharhuma, and do not repel them. Wa qullahuma qawlan karima, and say to them a noble and good word. Waghfid lahuma janah al-dhulli min al-rahma, and to lower to them the wing of humility out of mercy. And say, wa qurabbir hamhuma kama rabbiyani saghira, and say, oh Lord, have mercy upon them, just as they brought me up when I was small. This is the status of the parents. This is the treatment of the parents in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ and the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhuma, which was narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, and different narrations. One of the narrations, when he asked him, what is the most loved deeds to Allah? Ahabba al-a'mal al-Allah. And another narration, he said, what is the amal? What are the actions or the deeds that are closest to the Jannah, nearest to the Jannah? Meaning that it, their closest actions to take one to the Jannah. The closest thing to take you to the Jannah. So these deeds are the most beloved to Allah and the nearest to make you enter into the Jannah. What did the Prophet wasallam say? The first thing he said, As-salatu ala wuqtiha. To pray the prayer at its times. Then he asked him, and then which action after that? He said, Birril Walidain. Being good and dutiful to your parents. And the ayat, it comes right after worshiping Allah as one and not joining any partners with him. And the hadith, after the, the greatest pillar of Islam, after La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, after the shahada, what is the greatest pillar of Islam? The salat. Right after the salat, it comes being good and dutiful to the parents. And pay attention, my dear brothers and sisters, to this hadith, which is a rather scary hadith when it comes to our relationship with our parents. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Ridha Allah fi ridha al-walid wa sakhatillah fi sakhat al-walid. That Allah's pleasure results from the pleasure of the parents. Allah's pleasure results from the pleasure of the parents. And Allah's displeasure results from the displeasure of your parents. So if you want Allah to be pleased with you, you have to make sure that your, your parents are pleased with you. And if your parents aren't pleased with you, and it's a just reason, pay attention to that. Meaning sometimes somebody's practicing Islam and his parents say, we don't want you to practice Islam. And they say, if you practice to this extent, we're not going to be pleased with you. And you say, the hadith says, brother, khalas, you're going to do I have to shave my beard, I have to do all that. It's not, it's, not, it's not what it's meant by the hadith. We're talking about things that is from the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah wants good things and that makes your parents displeased with you. Not obeying them in that which is obedience to Allah. Because the principle in Islam, as it came in other hadith, what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? لا طاعة المخلوق في معصية الخالق That there's no obedience to the creation and the disobedience of the creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in that which is obedience, that which is good, if we disobey them, we don't fulfill their rights that they have upon us, and they're not pleased with us, then this hadith implements us, so we have to be careful. The third command, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ مِنْ إِمْلَاقٍ نَحْنُ نَرْزُقَكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ Do not kill your children out of poverty. We will provide for you and for them. 
not killing our children out of poverty. This was something that they used to do in Jahiliyyah and the pre-Islamic stage where if they were poor, they would kill their children. And perhaps this is something that's not spread now, alhamdulillah. But nonetheless, there's two important principles to gain from this verse. First of all, any of the actions of Jahiliyyah, whether they're to this extent or less, all of them are forms of dalala, the things that are go against the, the teachings of Islam. All of them are forms of dalala, a strainness. All of them are forms of batil, of falsehood. And they're different levels. And the true believer, whether you're someone who entered into Islam or you're someone who was born Muslim but you weren't practicing and you came back to practice your deen, it's upon us that we leave all forms of jahiriyyah. And this is the example we see from our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and from the Sahaba. Some of the Sahaba, not all of them were like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anh, who was just and upright before Islam. Many of them had major issues. But yet when it came to Islam, they completely changed, 180 degrees. And this is how the believer is when he stands up and he does for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that if you're a true believer, you totally devote yourself to Allah. You totally devote yourself to your religion. This is the first lesson we gain from that. The second is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the razzaq. Allah is the provider. When Allah tells us, نَحْنُ نَوْزُقُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ That we will provide for you and for them. And this is very important that we have this iman in our hearts. Because the reality is that many of the Muslims today, they've been influenced by the Western way of thinking. So you know what? I'm only going to have one or two kids. See, the sunnah is to have as many as possible. See, I can't afford it. Subhanallah. Where's your iman? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote the risk for them. When they're born, they're coming with their risk. They're coming with their provision. Allah will give you more. Allah will open up doors for you. Allah will put barakah and blessing in what you have. نَحْنُ نَرْزُقَكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ That we provide for you and for them. Some people, they're scared to get married. I can't afford it, brother. How am I going to provide? She comes with her risk. Her risk was written for her as well. She's going to come with her risk and Allah is going to open up the doors for you. He's going to provide for you. If you put your trust in Allah, and this came in the hadith, from those that Allah will provide for, He's promised to provide for them. The one who is seeking to find that which is halal, the means of halal, by getting married, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide for him. Always remember that Allah, He's the, he's the razzaq. Allah is the one who provides for us. The fourth command, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الْفَوَاحِشَ مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بطن. Do not approach the immoral actions. That which is apparent from him and that which is hidden. That which is apparent and that which is, hi is hidden. The fawahish, all types of shameful sins, from illegal sexual relations outside of marriage, and even other things such as oppressing people, unjustly taking people's wealth, all these types of sins fall under the different types of fawahish. And it was called fawahish because, as the scholars mentioned, that al-fitra as-salima, the one who has the pure and the sound inclination, the fitra, the sound logic and sound mind, he rejects these type of things. Even the people, when they fall into these actions, inside they know it's wrong. We have lust, we have desires as human beings. But when you fall into these things in a haram way, people always regret it in the end. Even many non-Muslims, they'll, they'll tell you that they don't feel good after, they, they, they strive and they go after their desires. But once they fall into them, that they don't feel good in the end, subhanAllah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَلَا And do not even go near, don't come close to them, these fawahish, these evil acts. We talked about it last week, that Islam when it makes something haram, it, always, it also makes the means that lead to that haram, haram. And we gave examples, like what? 
Huh? Free mixing between, with opposite genders. What does it lead to? The Prophet ﷺ, what did he say? That a man and woman are not alone except for who's the third? The shaitan is the third. Also, we talked about lowering the gaze because that's the entrance to your heart. When you look at that which is haram, whether you're looking at it as it passes by on the street or you're looking at it on the screen, on the TV, on your computer screen, all of that leads to falling into that which is haram as well. Even subhanAllah, music itself. When Islam came and made music haram, the majority of music, no matter which language you speak, one of the main things music is calling to, what is it? Love. But what type of love? Haram love. Falling to that which is haram. So here it's enticing you once again to fall into the footsteps of shaitan. Therefore, Islam told us, Allah tells us clearly in this ayah, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا Don't even come near these fawahish. And subhanAllah, the beauty of Islam, it talks to the natural, we said the, the natural intellect and the, and the fitrah, this natural inclination that we have inside of us. And that's why in the example in the hadith, when the man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he was convinced he liked Islam, but there was one issue he had, that he liked women a lot too. So he came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, give me permission to make zina, to fornicate. If someone came to us with something like that in the masjid, most Mawlanas nowadays, what would they say to the individual? How would their reply be to him? You don't fear Allah, taqillah. How could you say something like that? How could you request something like that? Maybe even kick him out of the masjid, subhanAllah. But what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? He, he's, he's a, here's his weak spot. He has a lot of good. He believes in Islam. But he's weak when it comes to this. He wants to what? Have as many women as possible. What did the Prophet ﷺ say to him? Would you accept it for your sister? Would you accept it for your aunt? And the man's saying, no, I wouldn't want someone to do it to my sister. I wouldn't want someone to do it to my aunt. Would you accept it for someone to do it with your mother? He said, no, no, I wouldn't accept that. And he said, just as you wouldn't want someone to do it to your sister or to your aunt or to your mother, People want, don't want it to be done to their sisters and their aunts and their, mother, and their mothers as well. Right away, what? He understood because now he talked to the, the rationale of that individual. He talked to the reason of, that he, he understood. He talked to his fitrah, to the natural inclination inside. And therefore, it was easy for him to follow. So Islam is teaching us this. Yes, you have these inclinations inside. Therefore, don't even come close to it. Don't even come close to it. ما ظهر منها وما بطن. That which is apparent and that which is hidden. In Islam, we're forbidden from doing sins, whether it be openly or secretly. But which one of them is the worst? Open, secretly. Yeah. Both, obviously, are very bad. And both have their serious downfalls. And the, 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 the horrible outcomes, both of them. In one hadith, the Prophet Ali Salatu was salam, he said, Kullu ummati mu'afa illa al mujahirin He said, All of my ummah will be forgiven except for those who openly sin. So, what does this hadith teach us? That if we're falling into sin, at least don't do it openly. But another hadith, the Prophet والسلام, he told us about the ones who will come Yom Al Qiyamah with mountains of hasanat and good deeds. And it will go haba al manthura. It will go away like scattered dust. Who are these people? The Sahaba asked, Who are these people? They're coming with all these hasanat, all these good deeds. And then it goes away like scattered dust. Who are they? He said, They're the ones who transgress Allah's limits when they're alone meaning behind closed doors. So what do we gain from these two hadith? First of all, we need to refrain from sinning publicly. Leave it between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when you do sin behind closed doors, at the same time, you don't want to be consistent in doing it. The sins need to be the sins you fall into 
and then you reprint from it. You listen to something that was haram, you watch something that was haram, you don't make it your custom that every time you're alone, so this hadith doesn't fall upon you. And then you constantly repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah told us in the Quran, Inna Allah yuhibbu at-tawwabin. Allah loves the tawwabin, the ones who are constantly repenting. Constantly repenting because they're constantly sinning. It's human nature. All of us are going to fall. What's significant, what's important is that we're not consistent in those sins. As Allah told us in Surah Ali Imran, when he was describing the muttaqeen, he said, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسُهُمْ They do that which is immoral or they oppress themselves. They're muttaqeen, but they're human. They fell off the track. They were going on the straight path and they fell. Shaytan got them. Shaytan gets all of us. I always tell the brothers, in the reality in the battle with Shaytan, there's no Floyd Mayweathers who went 50 and 0. There's no Khabibs who are 27 and 0. Shaytan will knock you out. Shaytan will get you. All of us fall into his traps. But what's important if you want to be from the true believers who are striving when you do fall, that you jump and you get right back up. What did Allah say in this verse in Surah Ali Imran? That if they fall into that which is fahisha, that which is immoral, or they oppress themselves, Allah. They might, they're behind closed doors. Nobody can see them maybe. But what do they do? Allah. They remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the next thing, what do they do right away? They seek Allah's repentance. They repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They seek Allah's forgiveness and repent to Allah. And who can forgive the sins other than Allah? And then Allah said, And they do not persist on doing it while they know. So if we fall, we return and we repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately and beg Allah's forgiveness and we not persist on those sins. The fifth command وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ And do not kill the innocent nafs, the innocent soul that Allah has made haram upon you except for that which is with haqq, with justice, with that which is right. And we mentioned this in the Ibad al-Rahman that there's two types or the characteristics of Ibad al-Rahman that there's two types of killing. We learn from this ayah, it's clear. One that is unjust and one that is just. What is a just type of killing? Huh? When it comes to the qisas, when it comes to the punishments and the penalties, al aynu bil ayn wa nafsu bil nafs, an eye for an eye and a soul for a soul. You kill someone, then you unjustly kill someone, then you deserve to be killed as well. If you harm someone, then you deserve to be harmed as well. You deserve to be punished in the same way. Also, he said as, as an example of defending oneself, defending one's property, defending one's home and his family. If someone was to attack you and your family and your home and you defend yourself and you have no other way except for taking him out, then that could be considered permissible. Obviously, as they say, you try to harm him and call the police and things like that. That's the way you're supposed to go. But if it's you or him or you or your family, what are you going to do? If you're fighting for a just cause on the battlefield, that's also another way that's just and that's permissible. Other ways, the other way unjustly, to kill someone unjustly, not deserving someone who's innocent, uh, someone who is the, has permission to be in a Muslim country and you harm him, killing your Muslim brother unjustly when you guys get into a fight. And that's why we, it's important to always talk about what, controlling the anger. When Allah praises the muttaqeen wal kaadhimin al ghayd and the ones who control their anger at the time of anger all of us get angry but what happens at the time of anger i remember one of the sheikhs he said that we used to visit the brothers the muslims who were in prison in a muslim country almost all of them were there because they couldn't control their anger the ones who had big crimes because they couldn't control their anger and how do they feel the next day when they harm their brother they hit him or they came with a knife and they killed him and then they there's no turning back after you take someone's life and we look into the teachings of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he talked about the killing unjustly of a Muslim. He said, لا زوال الدنيا أحوان على الله من قتل مؤمن بغير حق He said that 
if the world were to be destroyed, it would be less significant before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the unlawful killing of a believer. That's when it comes to killing a Muslim, killing your Muslim brother. But also in Islam, we know that even killing a non-Muslim unjustly. What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? He said that whoever kills someone who is safe, and he, he feels safety around the Muslims. They're not Muslim, but he feels safe around the Muslims. He said that I am free from the killer, even if the one he killed is a non-Muslim. I am free from the killer, even if the one he killed is a non-Muslim. So whether you're killing a Muslim or non-Muslim unjustly, this is one of the commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids us from. Throughout the Quran, time and time again, you see this message. And we talked about even in the verses last week. The same message came. And this shows us the importance of staying away from spilling blood unjustly. At the end of the verse, verse 151, in Surah Al-An'am, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ this is, this is what Allah has instructed you or this is what Allah has commanded you. وَصَّاكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ And in the Arabic we say the Ten Commandments, what are they called? الْوَصَّايَ Al-Ashr. So here's where the name comes from in Arabic. وَصَّاكُمْ The wasiya. And the wasiya, it is a command from Allah with emphasis put on it. This wasiya. It's a command from Allah with emphasis, meaning focus, focus on these, the importance of them, the danger of committing them, the importance of staying away from what Allah told you to stay away from, stay away from in them, and the importance of doing what Allah told you to do in them. And this shows us once again the beauty of Islam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says at the end of the verse, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ That perhaps you will use reason, you will use understanding. Islam is a religion, calling you to use your mind not just giving you commands do don't do do don't do it talks you it, 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 it talks to you to reflect to use your logic to use your understanding and you reflect on these verses on these 10 commands you understand what allah means when he says that perhaps you will use your reason you use your intellect you reflect on them you see the importance of staying away from them you see the importance of doing what Allah told you to do in these verses. The sixth command. وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا مَالَ الْيَتِيمِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ حَتَّى يَبْلُغَ الشُدَّةِ And do not approach the orphan's property except in the way that is best until he reaches maturity. In Islam, what is the definition of the yatim of the orphan? The one who lost his father before he reached puberty. The one who lost his father before he reached puberty. The one who lost his mother, Islamically, is not considered an orphan. Where if you go back to the linguistic and the, and the Arabic books, the, in the animal kingdom, it's the opposite. The one who loses his mother is considered an orphan. Because who is the provider? Not someone who takes care of them. Who is the provider? Usually it's the father and the, for us. When it comes to the animals, who's the provider and the one who takes care of them, it's usually the mother. Therefore, that, that's, that's the difference between the humans and the animals. That's linguistically, as the scholars mention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He forbids us to, to, He says, don't even approach the orphan's money. Stay away from it. Beware. Illa, here's what, what does it, illa mean? Except. There's an exception to the rule. Illa billati hi ahsan except in a way that is best. What's meant by this? That if I'm responsible, for example, my nephew, my brother passed away, and I have to take care of his kids. It's now my responsibility. And he, and he, in a Muslim country, right away, the family steps up. It's me, I'm going to take care of the kids. They're my responsibility. I'm not very rich. Their father was well off, mashallah. He left them a, 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 a big sum of money. The beginning of the ayah is telling me, don't even go near it. But then Allah made an exception to the rule. إِلَّا بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنِ Except for in a way that is best. A way that is best, if I need to provide for them. For example, they're schooling. I can't afford to send them to school. So I can take from their money that they need in order for the education. Not wasting it, not playing with it. Say, well, I, you know, I get 20% because I'm... You know, 
Astaghfirullah. You give them what they need for the school. If I say, okay, let me invest the money for them. Let's say, for example, I can buy some properties for them and the rent will be coming in and they'll get paid for the rent. When they become of age, it'll be their money. It'll help support them as they go to university, for example. If you're investing the money instead of having to just sit there, then here is, it's, it's permissible to invest it. And that, this is what falls under the, what Allah mentioned in the ayah, Illa ahsan, except for the, that is best, for their needs or to invest and things like that. Hatta yablugha shudda until he reaches maturity, until he reaches the age of puberty, and he has the ability to know what to do. You have to test them as it came in the other ayah to make sure that they would know what to do with their money. And that's why it's important if someone's taking care of orphans or even with your own children, that you train them on how to deal with money, the do's and don'ts. Many times, children nowadays, whether they be orphans or not orphans, they reach the age of puberty. They don't know how to deal with money. They weren't taught by their parents. Everything was taken care of. Everything was paid for. All of a sudden, they have bills and responsibilities, and they're not taught. So important, we teach them from a young age. So we test them. We see if they're ready. Then we give them their money. Then it's theirs. We have no right to it, and we must give them what is rightfully theirs. When you look at the teachings of Islam, what came in this commandment, throughout the Quran and throughout the Sunnah, we see the focus on the rights of the orphans. We see the focus on the reward of taking care of orphans. Why is this? Look, for example, in this verse. Look at another verse in Surah An-Nisa, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about those who unjustly eat and take from the money of the orphans. The orphans are miskin. He's young. He has no ability to know what you're doing with his money. And you're taking a cut here and a cut there. You're, you're doing it for yourself. You're building a house for yourself. You're, you're, you're expanding on this. You're investing for your own self with their money. What did the law say about these individuals? <inaudible> Those who unjustly eat and take from the money of the orphans. <inaudible> then in reality, they're eating in their stomach and they're putting into their bellies, consuming into their bellies, fire. Nara. <inaudible> and they will be burned in the blaze in the blazing hellfire because you unjustly took from the money of this miskin who couldn't defend himself who didn't know what you were doing and on the other hand what did the prophet وسلم, say about the one who sponsors an orphan takes care of an orphan who raises him he said he'll be in the jannah with the prophet والسلام, like this see subhanallah the one who oppresses him what's going to happen to him in the hellfire subhanallah and the one who takes care of him, where he's going to be in the Jannah with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is because they're so vulnerable. They don't have the ability to defend themselves and defend their money. They don't have the ability to take care of themselves. That's why they're either a ticket to Jannah or a ticket to Jahannam. The seventh command, وَأَوْفُوا الْكَيْلُ وَالْمِيزَانِ بِالْقِسْطُ And give full measure in weight and sales meaning to be just in your business transactions and how you deal with people don't cheat people and this is one of the principles that we're supposed to learn from a young age all of us most likely at some time in our life have memorized Jizu Amma and what is the surah that talks to us about the importance of being just in our transactions when we're using the scales and we're weighing which surah? Al Mutafifin. Wailun lil Mutafifin. Woe to those who give less in the measure and the weight. What is the characteristics of this individual? Al Ladina idaktalu al nasi yastufun. That if they come to weigh for themselves, they get paid in full. They make sure every there's, there's not one ounce le less, not one bit less. Make sure you give me all of mine. But when it comes to their dealings with others, we the kalu awazanuhum. But when they come to measure or to weigh with the other people, that they are giving less than is due. So he gets paid in full, but then he cheats others. What does Allah say after that? Do these people not think that they're going to be resurrected? For reckoning, to be held accountable. For a great day. The day people will be resurrected. To Rabbil Alameen, 
the Lord of the worlds. And this reminder, whether it be in our transactions, in all of our actions, that we're going to be resurrected to be held accountable. You might get over on some people. You might cheat some people. But it's not going to work, Yom Al-Qiyam. You're going to be resurrected and you're going to be held accountable. And, it's going to, and, there's, and there's a scale, Yom al qiyamah for those deeds. Perhaps you're cheating of the people in the dunya will make your scale of bad deeds heavier and will be that will guide you to the hellfire. Audhu Billah, may Allah protect us. Just to make a, a quick buck, huh? To cheat someone to make a couple extra dollars here or there. But the reality is, those who cheat, what is the reality of the money that they make? Abdullah ibn, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, anhuma, he mentioned that whoever cheats the people when it comes to, this, to the scales and, 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 and the weighings in, in your transactions, that the risk, his provision will be cut off from him. His risk, his provision will be cut off from him. And this is the reality. And pay attention to what this means. Some people might lose their business altogether and suffer. Other people might still make money, but there's no barakah, there's no blessing in the money. Others might make money. And this is important because you see people who cheat and lie, but yet they look successful and they're making money. But you see they're living in misery. Inside, they're living in a living hell. Their life is miserable. They're not enjoying themselves. They're, they're going through emotional difficulties. They're going through stress. So they're going to pay for it in this life, and then they're going to pay for it in the hereafter. And what is the reality of someone who cheats, who cheats others? The Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam who gave the example of what it means to be a just and true leader. He used to walk out in the marketplace himself and see what was going on. Make sure everything was being done correctly. I've heard of a few rulers during this time who have done it. And throughout history, you've seen them, but it's very rare. The ones who go out and see for themselves. And some, Allah, even in some places, those who send out others to make sure everything's being done correctly. He went to Ali Salatu Wasalam and saw a man with a heap of corn. He was selling corn. The Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam put his hands inside and he found on his fingers that the wetness, the dampness inside. It was dry on top, looked nice on top. But it was damp and corrupted on the bottom. And he said, what is this? He asked him. And he said that it's been drenched by rainfall. So he put the bad underneath and put the good on top. And someone came to buy it, he would have given it to him like that. He come home, half of it's good, half of it's bad. He said, dude, you know, put it out in front of the people, the drenched part and the dry part. This is what I have. I have one part that's been drenched. You might be able to sell it for a discounted price. And I have this part that is good. And then he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, man ghashana, Whoever cheats us, that he's not from us. This is the reality of those who cheat others. The eighth command, And whenever you give your word, say the truth, even if it concerns a near relative. Ya Salam. Look at the justice of Islam. And look at how Islam teaches us to be just. Even if we stand up against our own relatives, even if we stand up and speak the truth against our own parents, what does Allah command us to do in the command in Surah An-Nisa when He calls us in the name of Iman? Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you have believed, kunu qawwamina bil qisti shuhada lillah. O you have believed, be persistently standing firm for justice. Witnesses for Allah. The Muslim, the true believer, he stands up for justice as a witness for Allah on this earth. We testify only for haqq. What did Allah say in the verse? Walaw ala anfusikum awal walidain wal aqrabin even if it's against your own self or against your parents or against your own relatives. This is Islam. If I made a mistake, if I did something wrong, I testify against myself. I messed up. I said a lie during that day and I repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And I said that was wrong. Your parents told a lie and you're asked to testify. I say, no, they didn't tell the truth. You're my son. How could you testify against me? This is what Allah told me to do. This is my religion. My religion comes before you. The same religion that taught me to respect you and to listen to your command taught me not to testify in falsehood for you. You're my relative. You're from my qabila, from my tribe. You're from my country. It doesn't matter. Because I'm standing up on this earth as a witness for Allah. I'm not going to testify in falsehood. This is the teachings of Islam. The ninth command, وَبِعَهْدِ awfu And fulfill the covenant of Allah. What is the covenant of Allah? That which He has commanded and prescribed for us. To obey Him and that which He has commanded us, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to stay away from that which He has forbidden us from. And to act in accordance to the Quran and the Sunnah as Imam al-Tabari rahimahullah ta'ala said in his tafsir. This is the meaning of the covenant of Allah. To fulfill all commitments is the way of the believer. Allah told us in Surah Al-Isra, وَأَوْفُوا بِالْعَهْدِ إِنَّ الْعَهْدَ كَانَ مَسْؤُولًا And fulfill every commitment. Indeed, the commitment will be asked about. You're going to be asked about it Yom Al-Qiyamah. Any commitment you make, you have to fulfill it as a believer. وَبِعَهْدِ اللَّهِ أَوْفُوا And at the end of the verse, once again, ذَلِكُمْ وَصَاقُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تذكرون. And thus Allah has instructed you, He has commanded you in these wasaya, in these commands, that you may remember. What was the first verse? تعقلون. That you'll use your intellect. Uh, you'll use your mind to think about the, what's being said. Here, that you will be reminded. And everybody has to be reminded. And perhaps when we look at this ayah, talking about the issue, maybe the issue we have is in our transactions. Maybe we're, we, we've been cheating a little bit in our trans, and it's a reminder to us. This is we have prescribed for you. This we have instructed. This we have commanded. So that you will remember. You will be reminded. Maybe you didn't stand up for justice. Maybe you went to one of your countrymen one time and you testified for him. Or someone from your tribe or someone from your family. Now you've been reminded in these verses. And then the last command, which came in the, in, the, in, the, in the last verse of the three verses, And this is my path, which is the straight path. So follow it and do not follow the other paths. For they will make you go astray from his path, from the path of Allah. The subul, the paths that Allah is forbidding us to stay away from in this ayah, the path of bid'ah, of innovation in the religion, the path of the ahwa, the different desires, or the path of shahwat, the lust and the desires of the dunya, to stay away from these things. These are the paths Allah is warning, uh, is warning us to stay away from. And He's commanding us to follow only one path, which is the straight path. And if you look at this ayah, Allah said that this is my path, sirati, mustaqeem, the straight path, fattabi'uhu, so follow it. A meaning one. It's only one path. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا subul, And do not follow the paths. So there's going to be a lot of paths out there. But there's only one straight path. The Prophet ﷺ, he sat around with his companions. And the hadith was narrated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. He said he drew a straight line on the ground. And then on the side of that straight line, he drew والسلام, small lines. And he said, this straight path, this is the path of Allah. This is Sirat al-Mustaqeem. And on the side of it are the paths. At the end of each path is a shaytan who's calling to it. There's a shaytan on the side of that path who's trying to pull you away from the straight path. All of these paths, all of these detours from the straight path, they might be glamorous. They might look nice. Huh? They might be calling you with different desires. 
They might come with different ideologies, different methodologies, different paths to make you go astray from the straight path. But beware. The Prophet ﷺ, he described for us what is the straight path in different hadith. In one hadith, he said it's clear, that it's clear, it's night, it's like it's day. No one will go astray from it except for the one who has been destroyed. He destroys himself by choosing to follow these other paths because the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it has nur upon it, it has clarity. And that's when the other hadith, he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, when he talked about all of the different sects that will come, the 73 sects, all of them in the hellfire, except for one. They said, what is the one, Ya Rasulullah, that will go to the Jannah? What is that one that will be saved? He said, the ones who are upon what I am upon today and my companions. The ones who are following the Quran. They hear to the Quran and they hear to the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the way of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. This is the straight path. It's a clear path. If you follow someone who's, or any path who say, we're calling to Quran and Sunnah on the understanding of Super Sheikh Mulana, who was able to fly through the air and walk on water, say, that's not the straight path. This is one of the paths that the Prophet warned us about, the shaitan calling you away from it. Did the Sahaba used to do it? The Sahaba used to say that? No, no, this came later. But our, our scholars understood. No, they didn't. Shait they understood from shaitan. Not from, not from the, the wahi, from the revelation of our Rahman subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the path of Allah, it's a clear path. Crystal clear path. The way of the Prophet والسلام, and the way of the Sahaba. These are the ten commandments. And at the end of this verse, once again, Another Allah said about the uh, and thus we have instructed you, thus we have commanded you that you may become righteous. So if you look at these three ayat from verse 151 to 153 in Surah Al-An'am, where we have these ten commandments, each one of them ends with the same ending, which is This thus we have instructed you, this we have instructed you with, this we have commanded you with. But the first one ends with what? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ That perhaps you will use reason. You use your understanding. You reflect. According to reflect, understand. And the second one, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ That perhaps you will be reminded. It will serve as a reminder for you. And the last one, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That perhaps you will become from those who are pious. If you listen to these wasaya, you listen to these advices, these commands, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us to, then inshallah ta'ala you will achieve the taqwa, the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life. Because we tend to tra translate the taqwa all the time as the fear of Allah. That's only one aspect of it. But the reality of taqwa is the consciousness of Allah in your life, the consciousness of Allah in your actions. And that's why when you have these one, two, three, four, five, and we reflect on them. Where am I from these ten? And it's important that we go home, my dear brothers and sisters, and we remember them, we reflect on them. Go home and open up these ayat. Go home and go to the verses we mentioned in Surah Al-Isra and see, are they the same ten? Are there a little bit of difference in them? And we say that and some of them are expanded in Surah Al-Isra to give you more uh, definition, inshallah, more explanation, inshallah ta'ala. So benefit from them and focus on them as well. And as we mentioned, even the other parts of the Quran. This is how we should read the Quran. When we come to these ayats, let me start to focus. Okay, I came to one. I can't. Okay, the parents. How am I doing with my parents? I haven't called them for some time. So bismillah. Alhamdulillah. It's, it's not a race when we read the Quran. It's, it's supposed to have an impact on our hearts and then show up in our actions. So I said, well, my parents, I'm not doing too good. This is the second thing from the Ten Commandments here. These wasaya, these commands Allah is calling me to. The second thing is my parents, I'm not doing too good. How am I when it comes to standing up for justice? How am I when it comes, I'm actually responsible for an orphan and I have his money. Am I doing my job or not? It's, these, these are the reminders that are coming to us. We have to see where, where are we from these actions. And Allah knows best. Allahu alam wa sallam wa barak ala Muhammad. Wa jazakum Allahu khairan.